get mad if that is not mentioned, you know, how it works. So thank you for being here. It is, I've talked to many academic audiences, but they didn't have anything better to do than listen to me. It's kind of a challenge because you have this bar with the drinks, so, but I've tried to keep you entertained and not desire to go there. So uh, I am going to present you what happened in my last year. My last year was important because I, I am an environmentalist. Okay, I study environmental science, this is what I believe is what most of people should be caring about. And then I realized that it wasn't going anywhere. And so I studied economics because I wanted to be where the big fellows push the buttons and make the decisions. And uh, then I, I did a lot of work, much of which I will present today. But I started what in the last years realizing that it didn't take into account one very important piece of the equation, which is individuals. That's kind of the what you take with economics. You kind of, you kind of take away or leave out of the door part of the things that are composed of us. And so this year, I started to rethink what I do using those lenses. And this is what I'm going to present. So it all started with the, and this, this work, where is it? This is, look at that. So it all started with, as was mentioned, work with the IPCC. So the IPCC, the UN decided that the research on climate change should be made available to the public. So they bring together a bunch of leaders and they force them in hotel rooms for six days in, in, or 10 hours per day every six or eight months for four years. And they asked these lead authors to review the existing literature and to go, come up with chapters that are consistent. So the ICC is divided into three groups. The first look at the sciences. I'm not talking much about that. So the climate actually you know, changed in the evolution of, of the of climate. The second group looks at what happens if the temperature changes, so what happens to crops, and humans, and so forth. The third group look at what we can do about it, how much will it cost, what technology should we use, and so forth. So I was in the third, and basically you have together engineers, uh, economists, philosophers, but also anthropologists and psychologists that try to speak the same language. Not only they come from different disciplines, but they also come from different countries. So that makes the so it's it's a nightmare for most. To me, it's the greatest experiment that you can think of international democracy trying to bring together science and policy making. So it is it will it is amazing. Okay. So some of the stuff the most of the graphs, scientific graphs that I present are coming from that report, but whatever I say, it's only me. So all mistakes are my own. So I want to first present the nightmare we're facing, and then either you run away or if you stick around, and I'll try to give you some solutions that we might have. So this is just to convince you that it won't go away on its own. So what you see in Dark blue are the historic emissions from fossil fuel. What you see in light blue is what we're gonna do if we don't do nothing about climate change. What you see in yellow is what we have in underground. So this is the potential emissions that we have stored under the soil of this planet. So it won't go away on its own. So we can keep burning stuff for a long time and make a mess. So and not only it's there to say if you don't do anything, but it's not getting better. So uh, block there is the change of the rate of growth of emissions. The yellow are the fossil fuels. Then we have other pieces that add to decay, mainly deriving from land use and forest burning. But so CH4, which is the other big ch chunk, comes from agriculture and uh, <coughs> cows and and, and stuff like that. So it's basically a mix of your diet, our diets, and again, energy in part. So what you see here is 
somebody didn't get the message or the report. So the emissions are actually increasing more fastly than before, not decreasing. And why is that? So there is a guy called Kaya. He is a Japanese professor. I think he's a genius, unrecognized genius. He made the problem very easy for everybody to understand. So he said, okay, let's decompose what emissions are made of. And what are they, they are made of four things. One thing, how much population comes on the planet. So the, great, the growth of population. Second thing, how richer is becoming that population. Third thing, how much energy we need to, to sustain that wealth. Fourth thing, how much emission intensive is that energy. So you could have energy made out of solar panel or made out of coal, the emission intensity of the energy will change dramatically. So what happened, so the, the, the diamond there is the total. And what happened is that the rate of growth has increased, as you see there, and, but most importantly is why. Why is it there? First reason, a large part of the world has become richer, which is a good thing, because this part of the world, a large fraction of these rich, rich, more rich people were very poor. So this is very good. But then we have the, the red component. As you've seen, you can notice that the red component that was previously down is now adding. Well, it's, it's a little bit off, but it's now adding. So before, for the last decades, what was happening was that we were becoming more people and richer, but at the same time, we were reducing the growth of emission because we were becoming more efficient and less carbon intensive. So we were coming up with the idea of producing less energy and better energy. What has happened in the last decade is that we have become more rich, we have increased in richness more, and basically the red part there derives from the fact that China has been mainly growing its energy by burning coal. So that is the red chunk up there. So something is not going in the right direction, and we know from science, so here is, is I'll do two slides with graphs and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave you brief for a while. So what happens here is that this is nothing but how much stuff we put in, we put, we put in the atmosphere. Okay, the more we go in that direction, the more stuff is up there. And on the other axis, you see how much temperature increases. So I've told you that very known fact, it will go along by its own. That's certain, almost sure, okay. Second fact that I told you is that emissions are growing and are derived by our fossil fuel burning. Third fact, still completely, extremely certain. I mean, these are IPCC way of expressing our certainty about the fact. We are almost certain that these emissions are staying in the atmosphere. We're sure about that. And these emissions are rising the temperature. But now, I'm starting to introduce a little bit of uncertainty. We know that temperature will increase. We don't know with certainty by how much. We know with certainty the direction, but not the magnitude. So you see that there are ranges there, because we are now around here, about a little about 350, 360, and we're starting to see some temperature change already. But then if we double that, or more than that, we would, could have increases in temperature that range between 3.8 to 4.2. We see more of that. Now, if this is already starting to have some uncertainty around that, this graph is all about uncertainty. So you see the temperature there, today's temperature, and then the graph tells you what happens while temperature increases. And these amber colors show you or are the best that we could, the, the IPCC could come up with in visual art to try to represent the uncertainty surrounding that. What, what I wanted to keep your attention on is are two things. One is that large scale singular events will start to become a threat, but for temperature around four degrees Celsius. So it's far ahead of the future, and we will talk about that in a second. So singularities are large-scale events, are the collapse of the thermal 
collapse of system, for example, Greenland that completely melts down, or the circulation of the oceans that collapse. These are large scale singularities that if, if they will happen, they will happen very far in the future. A second thing that, again, it starts to become red around two, or, sorry, four degrees Celsius, it's global impacts. So we are going to have global impacts, impacts for everybody with a large, with, cer with certainty or high likelihood, only for very high temperature. What that means is that we will see something happening, not far in the future, but it will harm few people, very vulnerable people. So you see that the link is starting to be less, more and more tenuous, more and more less and less clear. Not only it's going to be far away pe people, people living in the future, maybe not the distant future, but they will be the more, more vulnerable people, people we don't see, almost of us don't see every day. So the link between our emissions and our grandchildren is a very fragile link. To see. So there is beautiful literature. I'm showing you a graph with the hands because here we are really into deep uncertainty, okay? So we know for sure that these are supposed to be crops, and we know for sure that temperature that is on this axis is bad for crops. Okay, when you a lot of studies have shown that there is a threshold temperature before that temperature heat is good. You cross the temperature and then yields start to decrease very rapidly. We don't really know with certainty where the threshold is. We know for some crops, we know from some latitudes, but we don't really have the full picture. It could be there, it could be that it's much worse. And we see the same relationship for women. Oh, sorry. I'm so sad. For humans. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to see some of that later. So it's just like Homo sapiens. I was thinking, why do we have to call it Homo sapiens? So for humans. And uh, because, because basically what happens is that people working outside start to get less productive. Okay? Now, that relationship again is clear, it's there. We don't know where where this threshold starts to be problematic, and then we don't know how much we can adapt to it. And again, there are beautiful studies looking at countries. Again, there is a sweet spot, sweet spot temperature that is around, I'm not joking, the temperature you get in Palo Alto. There's a sweet spot for productivity. Then if you go above, if you go below that, here in Russia, it's hotter, it's better. But most places that are above there, the, the rate of growth of GDP is lower. So you have this relationship well documented for many different elements that compose our life, but a lot of uncertainty still surround this relationship. So I'm telling you a story to start from our action, our emissions, and go to the effects on the planet. And that's, a, you know, it's a clear cut story. It's a closed chapter, we're not discussing that. But I'm telling you a story of the effect that this temperature has on the planet, the biosphere, and that is a complicated picture we don't have a full idea. We know that there is going to be um, negative things happening. We know that some bios, that some, for example, the, the place where some species are thrive will, will, will move, will shift. In some cases this is okay, it can happen. In some cases for plants, they, don't, they're not, they might not be fast enough. And then there is a link between all this and your grand grandchildren. That's a very, as I said, uncertain link. Now, what can we do about that? The first thing, I am a member of the IPCC. I have to warn you, there is no one single bullet. So people try to sell you one single solution. That's not true. What we know is that there are some things we can do and uh, they, the ones that look better than pictures are renewables, but you also need a little bit of nuclear, a little bit of CCS, and capture and storage. They look less beautiful in picture, like, but they'll be there. So you have to decarbonize your power uh, production. 
Then you have to do something with transportation. Tonight, somebody was talking about other forms of transportation that we need to decarbonize. This is shipping, this is you know, planes. We have to find ways for those. And then we have to find some ways of coordinating among countries because if the US do it, does it and China doesn't follow, it doesn't do anything. So we know that, and this is clear, and kind of it's a, it's a bit of a highway to the solution. The problem with that is that if I translate this message into what is that you can do, then the picture gets a little different. So what can you do? Well, you can start changing the way you move around, but you can use the bike only that much, okay? You can think of becoming a vegetarian, or even better, vegan. That's a good idea, but good luck with that. I mean, I'm trying. <laughs> no, it's not easy, it's not easy. And then you can try to do like my kid there, so you can become an advocate. You can, you know, <laughs> this group is doing 350.org, they want not only to reduce emissions, they want to have concentration that go back to what we had before the Industrial Revolution, which means we should take away CO2, suck it out, and put it under the ground, okay? So you can become an advocate. The relationship there becomes a little more complicated. Why? Because what you do is, I mean, you start, you come to work all sweaty, you eat all this cycle, and then the guy <laughs> next to you is coming with a big SUV and is eating all this big steak and just make up for what you're, you're using. So it, again, the link becomes so fragile with what you can do. And so what you do and what you can actually accomplish. So. Basically, I have for you a case study that really exemplifies this very well. And this is the low carbon grandma that I have in my family. So she's a very frugal person. She, if she can, she will follow you to switch up the lights. She doesn't. She just go on using her bikes. Okay. She does everything as as you mean, more frugal than that you cannot be. But then. What happens is that when her grandchildren comes to live in California, she does two flights in a year from Milan to California, and she basically offsets all the reduction that she could have done otherwise. Okay, so she's bringing up her carbon footprint again. And why is that? Because she cares. I mean, she's frugal because she cares. Okay, but we are individuals with multiple goals, and we cannot we cannot pretend we are not. We have multiple goals and they compete. So she cares for her grandchildren, which means she will fly here, okay, no matter how many emissions. So is she, should we, so what could we do about that? This is what I've been thinking this year. So there is a problem and then there's us. We want to solve the problem, but it's come much more complicated. So that's why Climate change could be called the perfect storm. Not even in the worst Gotham City scenario, you can plan something like that. So this is this is basically soaked in our life. It's everything we are is based on fossil fuel emissions. That means that we don't like to change as a species. Most of us, I mean, maybe in the valley some. People here think differently, but most of us do not like to change. We like the status quo. We have strong bias versus what we have. So, first of all, it's a problem that is embedded in what we are. Second, it's full of uncertainties that make it very, very difficult for us to understand. And it's so complex that to see our action and, and, and realize that that is creating a damage to the future is very, very complex. So some people say, if only we could color CO2 emissions, we would see it better. So all this uncertainty is basically statistics, and we don't reason with statistics, so we're very bad with that. And above everything, there are all some vested interests. So when I show you, when I showed you 
the beautiful the arable yellow bars and how much we have on the ground. There are people who are, you know, paying, you know, they're betting on that. There are a lot of best leaders in that. So it just makes it a very hard problem to change. On the other hand, there is us and our lack of, or our humanity that makes it so hard to get to the end. So our action feels so small that self-efficacy fails to give us the, the propulsion to go and bring our action, litigation action, to the end. So you can decide, okay, let's get drunk and let's forget about this, or you stick with it for a little more, and we try to see what kind of different responses have tried to give to, give to this problem. The first, which I will go through with you, is what I call think fast. It's, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the thinking fast and slow idea of our emotional brain that is what basically make us drive here, make us do most of the things we do. It's just, it works in an instinctive way. It's, we are on that mode most of the day, okay? And so if we leave our, or if we look into that part of our brain and we see what responses that part of our brain gives to the climate change problem, we see that we cannot really go. I, I already am selling you part of the story. We're not gonna go, we're not gonna be very good in answering with this first technique. Then there is the ethical way, and then there is the thinking slow, which you probably have already perceived as my you know, selling plan. So that's what you're thinking for. So what many, many people solve many, many problems, environmental problems, just by being ourselves. We solve problems related to water and many other issues. So I'm not, I wouldn't put biodiversity, but certainly pollution, many of the pollution problems have been solved, some are still there. But with the, you know, with our self, emotional self, we can solve some of these problems. If they hurt our kids, we will do immediately something about that. But the problem is that Homo, homo sapiens, as I was emphasizing before, is not primarily a creature of rational de deliberation. We're kind of, we are actually a creature that learn from emotion, from experience, from habit. We use associations, so we, and then we have, remember the grandma, these multiple goals, okay, that all require our attention from our brain and may be confused. So, this graph, you don't, I'll explain you the graph. You don't, need to read it. you don't need to read it. So I'm plotting there Google searches of the word climate change, and one indicator that has been built that describes the threat index, so how much people felt or feel threat, threat, threatened by climate change, and actual weather related disasters. It turns out, now we are doing a study of using Twitter, it turns out that basically what really matters for people's perception of climate change is whether you had a storm or not. Whether you, I mean, you can imagine that. So if it's snowing, if there is a snowstorm, and a lot of people start to tweet, uh -huh, uh -huh, and now there is climate change. Uh -huh. or, or if, if it's hot like crazy, or it's not training for three years, then people start to tweet, ah, there is climate change. So people are really susceptible of what they, what is saying to them. And unlikely, uh, we are very unlucky because climate change is most of the time not very salient. So availability bias and the role of science are a big problem for climate change, but also, and in general, the fact that it's not something you can experience pers personally. But also, the second element is the linear thinking. You remember I told you that climate change is, is dangerous because there are some singularities, some non-linear problems. So you put more and more and more, and it's just not getting bigger and bigger. It gets bigger and bigger, at some point it explodes. This is a non-linearity. We are bad at predicting those um, events, okay? So we don't really reason in that way. So these are reasons why you might be, you know, we don't know, the reason why I'm putting this picture of a denialist is that I want us to love denialists because they represent us. They're not bad people, they just are humans, okay? And we should stop fighting them. They're just 
They're just humans. They use their fast thinking, and that's something we all do. And they, they simply are more open about that. But the problem is how to bring this kind of reaction. Now, I, I don't want to throw everything away. So there are some good parts of these biases, and we should use those very kindly. So when you have a crisis, the crisis you change stuff. So we should not rely on the crisis, but when a crisis comes, we should come. You, we should make things push for things to happen. So never let a crisis go wasted. With crisis, you have you have changes in every kind of legislation to protect workers, to protect uh, minorities. So if a crisis comes, we're going to use it. Okay, we're not too beautiful, too beautiful for that. But another things are good with crisis. So we could change the fault so that if, if the fault is biking, okay, we only have bike roads, and then there is a tiny road where just one car or one time that has to go very slowly. So we can use the fault in our favor. So once we know the biases, we can use them. We can use risk aversion to emphasize the fact that there is going to be risk for business. This is but well, so the, there has been a huge report in the U.S. showing what the risks for business are and leveraging on the fact that people are risk averse to make people to make people do something. But rather, other than that, we cannot get too much out of a simply thinking fast response. So, so then there is the ethical response. This is my. It's always been my favorite. This is what I I was before coming this year to California. This is this is the reason why I always thought we should do things. We should do things because it's the right thing to do. Because because there are rights of the for people that were damaged in the future, rights of future generations, rights rights of this planet. There are so many rights that I can think of. Most scientists use these arguments. And not only, I don't know if you've read that, but it's not just a scientist. So the Pope came out last week. It has an encyclica. And I never read the encyclica in my life, so I, this is the first time. And I can assure it's like a scientific paper. So the only difference is that the introduction, instead of reviewing literature, reviews what other popes have said, what saints have said, and then there is the punchline, and then there are like, like a, a such paper. <laughs> but it's kind of different. And uh, it's kind of the care of our share of. And I think, I mean, it's an amazing, I, I, I'm not religious, but I think it's an amazing piece of, it, it reports the science in kind of a correct way. And uh, it talks to everybody, so it says that this is our shared own, so it's not talking about only people, you know, uh, that are Catholics or whatever. And the two arguments are stewardships, so man should, man should be a steward of the planet, and caring about the poor. So he pulls the two together. I think it's a, it's a, it's a masterpiece, you should read it. And the, but the, 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 the way we should be solving the problem is by a moral revolution. Now, what I come to understand by living in this country a year is that it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So, <laughs> so, so what it is, what it is I, you know, if you start to read, there are beautiful people that work at the edge of philosophy and the way the brain works, that they show you that what our, our moral attitudes are, are obviously nothing but the result of what we lived. So think of your mind as a square, when it's just snow. I know it's difficult for Californians, but think of the snow. So everything is white, and then people start to work, and start to walk around. And this is your brain. When you're born, it's white. And then you have the experiences, and there are all these paths that are created in your brain. And that creates what you are, who you are. Now, you might be born in a specific environment where it's much easier for you to think we should do with some, some, doing something about climate change. But it might be that you're born somewhere where it's much, much harder. It's not natural to you. So rights 
what is right, what is medically right, it's very, very dependent on what you are coming from. So, so this is where I don't think the you know, I mean, I think the ethical response is a good thing. I have it in my heart. I deeply think that the end should be that. But I don't think that it's as us crossing the tribal divide. They're there, they are there, and there's no way that a folk, uh, something that the folk brought is going to change their mind. It's, they're not going to feel. They're going to be. They're not going to get emotional about that. So I don't think that's going to work. And even if that was the solution, then it wouldn't tell us what level of action to do. So there are people who think we should go tomorrow only using solar. Maybe it's a good idea. I bet you think it's not a good idea. It would be, it would, you know, you would have stranded assets everywhere in the world. You have a lot of coal power plants. So that kind of revolution would be kind of crazy. So you, when you want to decide how much you want to mitigate, how fast, you, you cannot use the natural reason. And then, and this is the worst, I mean, we do not know nothing. I mean, do you, for how many of you, how many of you, to actually donate 20% of your net income to charity. You can, I mean, she's there, she does it. I mean, there are only percent. So, there, we, we don't, we simply don't do it. Okay, so we, plus we have, maybe we might evolve into that, we are not there Yeah. So I don't know, so if you start to say we should do it out of ethical concern, people rightly so will tell you, now first you give money and you, you, you uh, help alleviate poverty, then we solve climate change. I have that so many times that I, you know, I know it by heart. That's the response, and there is no answer to that. I don't have something. So I don't think we should throw the ethical response, and I think there is one key element we should save, and that is we should use the modern reasoning to make the process by which we may take the decision ethically sound. So I and then we see if we can do more with that. Now as I told you before this is my you know what I think it should, we should be doing we should slow thinking we should enter in a model which is a manual mode I have I was talking before with somebody with a beautiful camera that looked like a manual camera, it was actually a digital camera. So we should actually have a manual mode, okay? We should slow down the thing, we should use models, not just one, many models, question all of them, pull the results together and try to get a sense of what they're telling us. So when you need a model, when you have to run a model, with a problem that is complex like that, you, have, you need many people. So I love this, so this is the, my research group, together there are two people who are managing the research group. And this is the picture they sent us to say, it's all right, you're in the US, but we're working. And so if you see them, they're kind of, I mean, this is the room where we typically have meetings and they're, you know, sleeping there, smoking, pretending they're drinking, I hope they are pretending. But you need several people with very different backgrounds to run a model like the one I have in mind. You need people, people with a background who know how to model land use, economics, behavior, people who know or can get a sense of what happens in the ocean, local air pollution versus global pollution. So you have all these different expertise and you have them to work together on a project which, you know, which is a collaborative project with people with different languages. So we go back to the LPCC. What do you do with models like that? We, for example, project different futures. So the black and purple are potential futures if we do not do nothing. So what we call baseline or business as usual. Okay. So if we do nothing, the emissions will keep growing. In some, so you can really explore many different scenarios. You can ask yourself, what if we don't care about climate change, but we care about local pollution? For example, the Chinese start closing down all the coal power plants near your city. They shift a little bit towards gas. They invest more in nuclear. So there could be, without any climate change concerns, some changes. So this is the huge span of emissions that you can think of without any actual action on climate. 
And then you have scenarios where emissions peak and go down dramatically. In some cases, global emissions go to zero or negative. So all these scenarios, what these scenarios imply? These scenarios allows you to look into the future, 100-year future, and ask questions like, what would the world, what does this world, what does the future imply in terms of emissions? What does it imply in terms of reduction in growth? Because we will have to give up some growth. Where can we, where is this the reduction in growth of GDP happening? These, for example, are figures, I don't need, I mean it's late and, and you, so I don't need you to go to the future, but it's like an idea, you get information like what are the costs? Okay, how much can it cost? Can it cost that much? Well, we know that cost will increase the more we become ambitious in the cutting the emissions, and the other important thing is that cost will become greater further in the future. So, that story that people keep telling you, you pay today for benefits tomorrow, that's not true. If we start to reduce emissions, most of the costs will be, will be paid by the future because it, it's in the future that, on the one hand, we are, the baseline of emissions is higher. On the other hand, we have to become more ambitious in the cost. So they're gonna pay the cost of mitigation the most. So okay, you can ask questions like, what, where does, Who's going to be losing and who's going to be winning? Which sector are going to lose? Well, you probably are, have bad already that if you cut emissions seriously, the extractions of fossil fuels and fossil fuel plants are going to be out of the window pretty soon. You're going to have reductions in the investment in those technologies or those sectors, whereas efficiency for nuclear or renewables, well, it's going to be an increase and investments in those technologies. So you can answer questions like that. Now, I, then you can also ask questions like, these are different temperature level, how much is that gonna cost? This is a hard part of the question. This is the one part I never wanted to ask myself. I want to say, I don't wanna have temperature increase, okay? Let's stop temperature increase altogether. But if you accept to, to let go of that part of you, and you accept to think slow, you have to accept trade-offs. Maybe the answer that comes out is not your favorite answer. Maybe the answer that comes out implies that we lose a part of it. Because we have to allow, you know, we cannot, we cannot slow down emissions or slow down temperature increase fast enough, it's too costly. So what I'm saying is that you really have to accept you're gonna have trade-offs. Okay, so this is my masterpiece figure. You might not understand how much work we have. But this takes all the FPCC and put it in a figure that we hope everybody is kind of able to read. So here you have a two degree word, which basically is a word where you stop and climate change. And there you have the opposite, the four degrees work. You basically didn't do anything for climate change. And then you have two box plots. In blue, you have the cost of mitigation, and you can, you can compare that with the cost of climate change, which is in red. Okay, so it's not one number. I'm giving you results of several, many models, many, many models, many, many runs. So I'm giving you a certain information. And you can, you can look at this, and every individual can start to say, well, if we see these costs, costs of mitigation, and I see those costs, costs of climate change, well, it's a no-brainer. I want, I, this scenario is choosing, staying here, it's a world where climate change costs are way are higher than how much it would cost to mitigate climate change. So, this word here maybe doesn't make any sense. Now we can move to this here. Here, the red now is the climate change cost. These are become these have become small because I've reduced climate change. I mitigated strongly, and I have larger mitigation costs. And why are they large? Well, it can happen that nuclear is not a good idea. We start to deploy nuclear, and then we see that you know stuff that we didn't want starts to happen. Or maybe we see that people do not like carbon capture sequestration. They don't like the people who, who store CO2 
you do underground in cities. Something might go wrong. It might be that solar keeps, I mean, costs have been going down, but now it plateaus. So something might go wrong. And if we go too far, too early, it could be that it's not a good idea. So somewhere around here could be where we balance really, we are really balancing out the costs and the benefits of mitigation action. Mm. But this is uncertain. So you could say, you could be, any of us could look at this number and say, I'm very, very, very averse to any of I'm not, I'm not looking at the distribution, I'm only looking at the extreme. I only care about what, if everything goes wrong, what happens? Well, that's the point of bringing this information at the table of the negotiation, because that might be you. Somebody might have a different view, and so basically the transparency of having the numbers allow people arguing not on a medical belief, not on what is right or wrong, but on numbers. So that you have to justify to me what is you are not accepting about mitigation mitigating climate change. And I have to justify to you why I think it's a good idea. It makes sense. Now, and here I go. So I was looking for a picture of evolution where from the monkey you get a womb. But apparently on the web, the only one that you have is with a woman with a briefcase, which I thought was a good image. So this is the best that we get, some kind of person which we really didn't know what the gender is. But my point here is that we might evolve at some point in a person, that, in, in, in individuals that care so much about everybody. We don't have a gravi gravitational center. We don't care more about our grandkids than other people's grandkids. We might evolve into that, but we are not now. So to pretend that we are that thing, it's kind of, so we have to admit we have these biases. This is who we are. We have to admit that with ethical grounds, we are not going that far. And maybe this will help us opening a door to a debate with the other part of the America that is clearly not of this stuff tonight. Okay. But we have that, that they have to, they have, we have to open the door again, I think, and try to have a conversation with these people because it's only with them. It's only if you, this country, comes aboard that we go somewhere. So you have to convince the other half. And I hope this, uh, this, what I told you, can serve the purpose of you convincing one of your neighbors that maybe we should do something about that. So this is it. Thank you. So I don't ask the questions, so come afterwards if you're like. Yes. <laughs> so, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask you a couple things. So you're looking, you're looking at policy a lot, and policy makers and what policy makers do. We talked a lot about individuals tonight. How are the policy makers, because they're humans, is this scaling up from the way humans are reacting? Do you see the same dynamics, the same uh, types of things, or is policy making have a different characteristic to the way they're looking at these problems, ethical approach? The, the, what, what, what's, what do you see as, as you look at so done, those decision makers? They've done experiments. Uh, negotiators tend to be more strategic than students, for example, in their behavior, as you might expect. They tend to be better in compromise, but they also are older than students. So the only comparison that we have is between most of the experiments today in what we know about behavior are on students. So uh, it's much more costly to have business people or negotiators sitting and attending an experiment. So the few examples that are out there show that they can, negotiators tend to be more strategic and more able to compromise. We are now trying to run experiments at the, with, I was talking about negotiator in general, WTO negotiators. We're now trying to run experiments with final negotiators. Um, 
Yeah, like they're pretty busy people when they are there, so they, they don't want to, you know, they don't care, but, you know, they're humans, so mm -hmm. they most likely are, you know, even though they're activists in climate change, I am active in climate change, and I travel, and I eat red meat once a month, how many, maybe, maybe more, yeah. and so I am, I mean, I'm guilty, and they actually found out, they did a beautiful research showing that people trust much, much less climate scientists when they discover that they fly, that they eat red meat, so trust is also linked to the, what you see these people actually implementing, so it's, behavior is relevant also in, uh, spreading trust and people. Um, so, so we have, I actually know, our, our audiences here are always really interesting. We always have uh, a lot of people with expert knowledge uh, in the area. So I know, how many people here are working in alternative energies spaces? So uh, how many people are working other, additionally to the climate related, Work in general. So, so we have a lot of folks. So, um, how many of you are of you are vegan? Vegan, sorry. Vegan. Let, vegan. let the record show. There's, I think, one hand. Is there? <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so, so, do you think for 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 people that are are working in in those industries, is there a collaborative? Thing that should be happening across technologies. You said there's no single bullet. So, um, what what do you from from what you've seen and what you're seeing internationally? Do, do you have a, a thought on what the collaborative approach of everyone who's dedicating so much of their lives to it? So there is an agreement now. And you probably are all aware of the sign between the U.S. and China. It's an agreement on technology. That's basically all there is to it. So. So there are target emission targets that the two countries pledged for, but the main soup of the agreement concerns the technologies, transfer of technologies. Now there, it's, it, there is a lot of potential because um, a lot of um, engineers or people from Qinghua, the best universities in China, are really willing to collaborate and there has been, I mean, something is growing there, but the private sector in the U.S. that was mainly interested in to trying out carbon capture storage has now retreated from uh, that, uh, that possibility. And the main reason for that is that I think most people in this country believe that with cheap gas, you're gonna get, you're gonna get very near to this soft target that the U.S. out imposed on itself. And so there, there is not going to be much need for any other effort by 2020. What happens after 2030, what happens after that? So, so I don't see any long now in the mind of policymaker and the private sector. But it would be good if anybody working on this wanted to start to look into China because that is a huge, marvelous market and there, there is where we need to cover a lot of emissions. So, so uh, what questions do we have uh, from, from our audience? From our... Uh, I'm really curious what the, the slow thing here really like. Uh, for me, it's a question of how can ordinary citizens participate in that kind of slow thinking to play with the models and convince their neighbors? Like it's, it's not just that we, we subscribe to models from policymakers and, and academics, but if we can't play with those models, we can't establish a sense of confidence around that. And how, how can we... So, so how can individuals participate uh, in, slow in the slow thinking model and, and spread that? So this is a, a huge debate in the community because as I showed you, you know, the escaping uh, people work on, on, on a model. Uh, the next generation, hopefully, will be building blocks of the models in open. So for example, some of these models start to be in open source code. So anybody can 
look into those. But that's something I use if it's just, you know, I read them. But what you're starting to build is a database bank containing all the ranks. That is publicly available. People are starting to fit into that. Some version of this database or data bank is more, I mean, some of it is very hardcore and not good looking, but some versions are starting to be developed which look much better and you can really go out and play. And uh, I, I, think, I think getting a sense, for example, if, if everybody starts to get a sense of how much it costs, when is the cost going to happen, and is, is able to create some of a culture, of some knowledge around that, so that it's not just few people in the RPCC knowing that, but most people knowing that, that, that might help in talking with your neighbors. Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Are you familiar with job based search both cloud metrics and all the research in connection with the mm -hmm. fact that we have to control the whole nation and what we call this term? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, it's still, it's still happening, yeah. yeah. My, my question was that uh, you were familiar with the. Speak into the microphone, please. Job, job based yeah. work in connection with the book he published with. No. Where, where he mainly states that uh, you know, the sun is more powerful than mankind. And uh, mm -hmm. that he based, uh, based on research from a model published two hundred years back that they are actually in a uh, mm -hmm. cooling phase uh, from Alaska until 2031, gradually more cooling because the reduced sunspot and uh, mm -hmm. what's called sol solar combination. What, 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 what do you think we can do in connection with that, that, that part of that actually mm -hmm. we have to prepare for the cooling cycle that uh, comes out of the sun? Yes. Well, I, I'm not, I, Whether there's a cooling system? I know, I know what, what is out there that I am aware of and it's been reviewed in the IPCC is this IATOS. So the temperature increase that we are actually seeing is less than its temperature is increasing it's in part less than expected and the main there are several scientific explanations for that the main explanation is the ocean intake of the heat that is coming so the ocean is working as a buffer more than we thought so this is this is but it's, there's no even though a lot of advocates have used this as an argument against or undermining climate science. I don't, th I don't think, so the climate science discussion, I think it's kind of lets them do their business and increase their uncertainties, but they're done for what was, we know that emissions are causing increasing damage. We know that. We have still uncertainty around the magnitude or the potential damages of that, but we have to make decisions with what we're not doing. You had a question right there. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's like two parts uh, related to the same question. So uh, throughout the talk, you talked about like kind of how do we convince them to make a change? I guess specifically like what agents are you referring to? Because as you talked about like uh, different parts of society have very different uh, different levels of influence and power to affect policy. For instance, you mentioned like the entrenched interests like the fossil fuel lobby. Uh, and so I guess like who exactly is we trying to convince? And then the second part is that like, uh, when you talk about like the model-based thinking, um, a lot of that has to do with like how well, what your subject uh, like your subjective perception of risk is. So how should different people with different like risk aversion and like utility functions deal with that? You want to can you summarize that? So so the first part is that different parts of society. So the first part is who are we talking about? The second part, how do we cope with the fact that people perceive uncertainty in different ways? These are questions one gets to the university, not to the bar. <laughs> so the first question, I completely agree. Okay, I completely agree with you that one has to focus on individuals. My point here is that I think mean, so. So it's. It, Principally, it should be my job or the job of the head of the IPCC. Actually, the my the chair of my working group was, for example, presenting to the poll the results of the IPCC. So you have scientists have to convey the message to call it, let's call them policymakers, okay, 
On the other hand, you still, I think you still need also to convey your message in a more capillary way. And to do so, you have to become an individual again. And you have to, and this goes back to the fact that you have first and foremost to think about to convince yourself. So you start to behave like you convince yourself, and then, you, so you need the two layers, the capillary layer where you actually are an exemplar of what should be done, and then the other layers where you learn how to talk to policy makers and so forth. On the second question, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the, the work that I started lately is actually on that, on how different people perceive uncertainty how they cope with a certain different way. So the question is, how do we aggregate that? Now my, my response to that is more and more becoming, let's find strategies that are kind of among the best for most of these different welfare functions that we have in mind. So maybe not the best for one single attitude to risk, yeah? but some among the best for most of these different attitudes. And maybe we can compromise on that strategy, a strategy that is kind of well performing under different assumptions about these strategies. Because I don't want to think, I, I don't think that we should claim we know what the right model is. Although economists do that, I don't think we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be so sure of it. How does consensus happen within IPCC with all these people of all these different backgrounds, united by but by scientific approach maybe, but different disciplines, different countries? Does consensus happen? Is is when we see a decision come out? How, how does how does that characterize? Is it unanimity? I mean, what, at what level is there consensus? There are. I, I mean, the one thing, the one problem I think is there is that you have a room and you have people speaking, for example, English as their, as their native language and, and people for whom it's not their native language. So I think uh, one proposal that has been put forward now is to, to start off the process of the IPCC where every researcher is in their offices and is doing a survey, an actualization survey, writes down their own idea. Then you bring the people together and you show them the various idea. So you risk a little bit less the potential. Although these are scientists, you still have the, you know, you still have group thinking and the potential of, of, of polarizing some ideas. So by eliciting this the experts' opinion prior to the meeting, you might have a way of avoiding excessive polarization or you know US experts talking half of the time and leaving no space for other people or stuff like that. So, yeah, so. All right, last, last one, was there a question at the bar over here? No? Okay, all right. Last question. I want to get, I would like to get a female evolved question here. <laughs> and then we're gonna take a picture of you for the, there we go. <laughs> Yes, well, the, the, you what's your question? question? What's your name? Rachel. Rachel asked whether we account for the private sector and their lobbying system. And this is something, so, so there are, so this is very complex. You need, you need a very detailed model to see how lobby could really play out. There are some experiments that I, that are now coming out that I'm aware of, where you see, for example, how uh, how different ways of different legislation cope in different ways, or different ways of designing the policy can have different enhancements. So say that you are empowered for a little bit. There are different ways to entrench yourself uh, or, or design a policy that stays there even though when you're not in power anymore, some lobbyists might come out and try to uh, destroy what you built. Okay, so this is some, so there are examples, but in the 
basic models you see are there, that is not there. What you assume is that you have some agents, but you don't see uh, the locking system and the power of the locking system. You can have it like exogenously, but it's not exogenous in the models. All right. Thank you. Thank you.